Um, let's see. We're gonna we're gonna go to what was C and <laughs> presentation on digital learning. And if our if if David would join us. By the way, you're not in your Apple uniform today, David. Oh, I lost a bet, Mike. I was going to say, is this, you don't wear a tie for five years. Schneider comes in, takes a tie off, and now you start wearing one. Exactly. I don't, I'm not sure what that means. Different. <laughs> <laughs> I think Matinga and, and David are both involved yeah. in this. Let me introduce myself. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I work with Apple in our strategic initiatives department, which basically means we get to um, work with governors and state leaders like yourself. There's eight of us in the country, and uh, we're sort of a hybrid government relations organization, but we work right with the VP of Education, and our sole focus is on transforming teaching and learning. And so um, we're passionate about what we do. And so you're going to get, hopefully, a fun little uh, technology talk. But at the end of the day, what I'd like it to happen is for you just to think outside the box. And all the things you were talking about today and all the things the governors talked about, I think, are, are part of that. Uh, Joanna Montgomery works for Apple. She's one of our former teachers who we sort of recruit into Apple. And um, we say that we sort of give them the Kool-Aid, and so they, they start to think and act like people <laughs> from Apple. And, um, and of course, Matinga, we've been working with her, because our first phone conversation, I said, are you sure you don't work for Apple? Um, she's very passionate about transforming teaching and learning, and, and there's a lot of us sort of in that space right now. So I'm just going to give a quick over. No, 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 you're not yet. I didn't even kick when, this off yet. When it's so. ready, but then um, I'll turn it over for these folks. <laughs> okay. I'm losing control here, David. You have yeah. to watch. You got to watch my eyes here. I'm just trying to get out of your way. Get the tie on, and immediately you start taking over. This is, um, David used to be uh, on staff in the legislature for years. Many of you would know him from there. Uh, Eileen suggested this kind of uh, uh, opportunity for the board, and I appreciate that. Um, this is not endorsement of a given product. We should be clear about that. I do think it fits very well with kind of what we we had been kind of envisioning ourselves and the governor, I think, captured himself also in what we call any time, any place, any way, any pace learning. And uh, uh, so it, with that in mind, I uh, appreciate it, Eileen, that you're bringing this to the forefront. I don't know if it's David first and Matinga working in or you're kicking that off. Go ahead. Nancy yeah. and Eileen both, I think, were very instrumental in them. Um, we're pushing this. We were very pushy. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Thank Nancy. You. I didn't. Well, I appreciate your pushiness, and I appreciate all of you taking the time uh, today. Um, yeah, I'm just going to give a quick policy level overview of sort of the lay of the land in the world of digital learning. And again, I'm going to go quickly. Uh, there's no way uh, we can become experts on digital content and digital learning right now. It's an explosive time. But uh, what I want to do is just let you begin to think outside the box, to take off the constraints, so to speak, of the way you envision teaching and learning uh, today and the future. And that's really what we try to do at Apple. And then I'm going to turn over to, to Matiga and also Joanna, who are actually going to walk you through and show you <coughs> what we're talking about, which I think is the best way to do it. Um, you know, we always start with why at Apple. And, um, I always start with why, and this is why I'm at Apple, and this is why um, I left the state to work with them. Um, there's a singularity belief that if you provide the right mental bicycle, everyone can find their own unique genius. And from 1970s, when Steve created the Apple IIe, uh, there's a video you can actually find on YouTube. He talks about the mental bicycle, and that's a concept we still have today, whether we're developing devices that none of us could even consider in previous years or whether we're talking about um, the personal computer itself, it really is about allowing people to define themselves and develop a mental bicycle to go somewhere they haven't been. And um, we're not going to go through you know, where technology's been. Obviously, you all know that. But I think when you look at this timeline, what has to jump out to you is that we are at a critical point in technology. And whether you realize it or not, we have redefined how people interact with content in a digital world. And we had several of those redefinition stages. There was the personal computer, where essentially we took power out of the hands of the universities and the powerful companies and people with a lot of money, and we put it in the hands of an individual on their desk. Right? And that was transformative. In the 90s, we did that with the internet, right? And Thomas Friedman did a great job of laying that out and how it made the world flat. But in the 2000s, what's happened is mobile technology has innovated to the point at which we've transferred how we actually interact with content. You can think about it as the mental mouse has changed. And that really changes where education is today. And I think 
the main aspect is to look at the adoption of technology. This is how long it took for 10 million users to adopt technology. Color TV, 19 years. VCR, 12 years. CD player, 7 years. Um, the device we're going to refer to today, it took uh, 9 months. And actually, we're at 20 million users in about 13 months. So technology adoption has changed in a way that I think um, really has a significant impact on where we are in terms of disruptive forces in education and teaching and learning. And so uh, if you look inside of adoption, this is the key to everything I talk about with you, and, and you'll hear me talk about this over and over, and that is when we look at technology in the sector of Apple and the Googles of the world, we look at how users experience that, right? And you always start out with this adoption life cycle. Would well, you take technology and you substitute it into your current way of thinking and your current way of acting, right? And the best way to think about this for today's discussion is a textbook, <coughs> right? You can easily take a textbook and put it on a Kindle, put it on an iPad, put it on some sort of device, and you sort of digitize it, right? Essentially, you've substituted your old way of thinking into a digital world, right? Is that where we want to be? Well, from the phase of I push the wrong way, but the phase of that, you get into augmentation or you get into the um, the actual phase of adding functionality to it. Then you've added things like I can take notes on this, I can write on it, I can experience the content, I can share notes, I can do these things. But again, Apple's focus is on the transformation phase, which is what if you completely redesign the task of receiving knowledge itself? What if textbook wasn't bound with binding? What if content and knowledge was a limitless set of continuums and you created virtual playlists of knowledge that was defined and personalized to each student? These sound like huge concepts, but they're happening today. And they're happening because the transformation is at our doorstep. And I think we have a choice, and more so you than I, right? Policymakers have a choice. You have a choice of where you want to take education as you reinvent it. As you look at these new environments and you look at the innovation that's occurring in Apple and Google and the world of technology, the speed that I showed you it's occurring at. And you look at that continuum, do you want to stay on a pathway of substituting in new inventions, new technologies into the systems of the past, or do you want to look at it and say, how can we completely redefine how we interact with teaching and learning? And that really is a key point that we're at today because of three what I call disruptive factors. And people are familiar with Clayton Christensen's work and how we look simply at virtual learning. But I think there are three real things that are happening right now in the world of education technology that directly impact the way in which teachers teach and students learn. One is <coughs> the innovation of these devices. Right? These devices aren't, uh, aren't a, a glorified mobile technology. They've taken the technology of uh, accesses and, and the environment in which you interact with that and change the way we define content and how you experience it, which leads to the final redefinition that Ting is going to show you, which is really about how teachers teach and students learn when you combine the world of digital and virtual with brick and mortar. And so the first uh, real disruptive change is, is really what um, the governor's speech talks somewhat about, and that is these technologies go with you. If you think about the book, you really went to a place to take content when you looked at the textbook or you looked at the school of, of, of the last hundred years, right? It was about a place in time. It was a point of interaction. In today's world, with mobile technology, really the point of interaction is almost anywhere. And the easiest way to think about it is the way I, ex I explained it to uh, my father the other day, which was uh, think about the desktop computer, right? Where was the internet for you? The internet was on your desk in that unit. Where is the internet today for a 10-year-old? Right? It's everywhere. It's around them. It's in their PlayStation. It's on their, it's on their Xbox. It's on their iPad. It's on their iPod. And so the interaction of mobile technology, really the disruptive force is, where's the internet? And these are our market trends. This looks worldwide at where we believe people access the internet, whether it be desktop or mobile-based. We think by 2014, uh, we'll see a complete transference over from desktop to mobile. In the college campuses, I don't have this graph with me, but I can tell you it's already happened. The lines have already crossed. And so um, what we see happening is really a change in how students interact with content. Now, I want you to forget the name iPad as it relates to Apple. Let's think of it as Kleenex, right? It's just a brand image. But right now, I want you to think about it as a category of content devices. And, and really, I want you to think about it as something brand new, is the way you interact with technology. And so 
if you think about the iPad today, for those of you who have one, <coughs> you've experienced this, for those of you that don't, the best way I can tell you to think about it is that this device, and similarly those out there like it that are being developed, is really transforming the way people look at content in their interaction with it, much like the mouse. So this device has six axes of motion detection within it. It has an accelerometer, it has several technologies that really are about experiencing how you are feeling the content in your hand, right? And so whether you're a classroom teacher and you're showing a student a star or you're getting in-depth into a constellation or you've decided at the end of the day, we're just going to look up at the star and the device actually shifts and knows that you're looking north at such and such a degree at such and such a star. So if we took the ceiling off the building, we would see what this sees. That's the technology that's inside this device that says content isn't a static piece that I deliver to you. Content is something I want you to experience with me. And once that shift occurs, a transformation occurs in how students learn. Right? And so the way we mix these together is we say, first of all, what is this content? Is it just putting a map and digitizing it? Is it simply being able to write notes? In fact, this is my other favorite example from from those of us who have ever said, well, I don't know if I want an iPad because I really want to be able to write my notes. Right? If you think about that, you're substituting a digital world into your current structure, right? You really haven't hit a transformation in the way you've redefined your tasks and your ability to do things. And so we want to focus a little bit more on that transformation phase, which is I want to take a tour of the universe right here, right now, and I want it to interact with me. And so that really is the change of a content force. Again, we can put print content, as the consumer space has shown us, as Kindle paved the way, and as the iPad and other devices are now looking, we can take print content and we can put it in digital format. In fact, it allows you to carry a library of books in your pocket. But really, it hits the transformation phase when you realize that the device itself is not technology. The device is the content. And that's really why we've hit almost 20 million users in such a short time frame. It's because people don't experience it as something I need to go to. It's something that needs to come to me. And Fraser Spears, the person with this quote, is actually a teacher we work with in Scotland. And we simply asked them, why did we create a device that all of a sudden millions of educators are picking up and adopting? Education is the last place that adopts new technology, right? And he said simply, the iPad is not technology, it's content. And I think that really showed us where we're going with these disruptive forces. So today, content is really the third rail that didn't exist when myself and a few others had a crazy idea years ago that we were going to give laptops to kids. Right? We really couldn't transform the learning environment because at the end of the day, a teacher had to create a lesson plan. And that had to align to a standard. And who has that standard all bound up in a nice little package? Oh, Mifflin, Parkwood, Pearson, right? Texas created it for us. Why recreate it? And so, Today, content has changed formats in a way in which it's not only with you, but it's malleable to you. So in other words, once we put together these different content buckets, today, the internet has almost become the substitution phase of content on these devices, right? You can go to an internet site, maybe it's CK12, you can download a PDF version of some lecture or some piece of content that you thought was unique iTunes has a whole repository of content, right? We have bookstores, whether it be Amazon, <coughs> whether it be um, any of the consumer spaces. But really, the transformation phase comes from apps, and that's what I showed you right here. And that is someone who's developed software around the content, taking the power of the device and the power of the interaction. And what happens is um, you really inspire the innovators to start to work. So Discovery Education, one of the first that came out, said, we are going to put together all this great content we have and make it available so that teachers can use this up to the minute just in time. Uh, iTunes U, Apple worked with universities very early on. Our mantra is not to create the best in the, of everything, right? Our mantra is to create a platform on which you create the best of everything. Thus the world of iTunes U, which was simply about unleashing universities with the power to create an iTunes organized set of content. And the growth within iTunes U has been one of the most amazing factors for us. We started out with a few universities. Now we're operating in over 90 countries in just five short years. And so one of the aspects of that free content growth is it's pushing 
on the paid content folks, right? Saying, where does this content go at university level? K-12 has been a little different. How do we interact with K-12? Do we allow every K-12 institution to create an iTunes U site? Well, that gets kind of muddy. How do we... So we went to the states, and you were actually one of the first six states that came to us and said, yes, I'd like to model core content under the auspices of iTunes U. Um, yes, we'd like to figure out a way to get that in the classroom. And so what happened was you created My Learning, which is your actually Michigan site within iTunes U. So whether you're on your iPad, your iPhone, your iPod Touch, or your PC, or your Mac, and you have iTunes, you can access content that's like your playlist. And the concept here is that this content is broken down into individual parts, individual pieces, that you can put together in a playlist and provide for you. In fact, just this last week, I learned about a new collaboration that's going on. McCall helps run this site with partnership with the Department of Ed. Uh, and they have a new partnership with the Spark Collaborative where they're actually going to take high quality Detroit public television content and access that with Wayne Reese and a few other partnerships and put together. The key to this is those eight states have now turned into 25 states. I'll be honest with you, Michigan's site isn't the most robust of all of them. But what sites are the most robust? Those are the sites where they've decided this isn't going to be a silo that we put out there and say this is content for you. We're going to make it a part of our school transformation initiatives. We're going to make it a part of empowering teachers to transform schools in our bottom 5%. We're going to make it a part of a larger strategy to look at content playlists that can bring all this together. And oh, by the way, we're going to tag it to our state standards. And that's really powerful because then you're a teacher at home at night buying a song. And oh, by the way, i got to teach algebra standard X tomorrow. There it is. Right. And so that becomes a more powerful part of this. The final transformative piece that I'll talk about is apps, because at this point, the app world is really a world where folks can create software for a mobile device. And for $99, anyone can do it, whether you're a 12-year-old or you're a systems engineer. That was our dream. Our dream was to get rid of Apple and Google and Adobe being the guys who told you in Microsoft, here's how you run your computer. We wanted you to tell the world, this is how. I want to interact with my content. That's what app development was about. And today we have teachers developing apps. We have 12-year-olds developing apps. We have software engineers developing apps. 350,000 in our app store, thousands in other app stores. Um, but really, <coughs> app development allowed us to say to the publishers, let's look at what the medical community is doing. They're taking this device, and they're saying, all the content we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis will now put inside of us. And touch technology allows us to cut that heart open. Uh, the technology of the axes, we can spin it, we can grab it, we can manipulate it. That technology can also update the content instantaneously. That's where the medical community took off. And that's where publishers and educators began to say, hang on, wait a minute. I've got content that we can put in this manipulable environment and personalize it to students. And I think the power comes we finally have the publishers at the table. Because let's be quite frank. Publishers have line items in state budgets. And I'm a former state budget guy, right? So I understand what happens. The line items go out. The adoption states say, here's where the money flows. And here's your textbooks. And they walk away. We had a hard time because they kept saying, well, we have digital content. We give you a CD with every book. Right? Well, the pricing structure never changed, everything around it. So we had a hard time at Apple trying to figure out and put our arms around this. And then something funny happened. 15 million people picked up a new device. And then the publisher said, oh, wait. Right? And so now we have this last six months has been the, the half year of the pilot, so to speak. Uh, Pearson linked up with the state of Virginia and created the Beyond Textbook Initiative, where they essentially took world history, social studies, math, their major textbooks of Pearson, and they created an app with all the functionality of personalizing the content instantaneously to the students' needs. At the other end of the spectrum, we had Houghton Mifflin say, I'm going to take my Algebra One book and transform it to the HMH Fuse, it's called. And it is a book that was created with the power and the transformation of an app whereby the content changes for the individual student learner's needs. And the <coughs> assessment is bedded into it. And oh, by the way, there's no more bindings of pages. This is all about pieces of content that you put together and you create a playlist around. The Houghton Mifflin book actually just came out for sale. It went so well in their pilot phase in California. 
and the state of Florida has already adopted it as their Algebra One textbook, along with legislation that says by 2015, all of our content will be digital. <coughs> and Indiana is following suit. <coughs> so you can see the pace and the breadth at which this is changing. This is my favorite because I'm actually um, a former budget guy, right? And my first thought is, if I'm spending X on a print book, what happens when I break content into pieces? Can I create 99 cent songs? The answer is yes. Raw Hill worked with an app developer called Inkling and created freshman level course content apps that essentially created a bookstore within the app. And that bookstore within the app sells the book as an entire digital version, 35% less than the print version. Or, you might not be able to see this, but you'll be able to play with it, by chapter for $3.99. The power is now as a professor, I don't have to choose your entire bound book. And oh, by the way, these books are transformative because once you're inside the book, now whether you're a student who's a visual learner, auditory learner, and so forth, the professor can follow along because it looks a lot like a traditional textbook. But the student follows along in a much, much different realm because the content actually interacts with their fingers, with the motion and the sensitivity, and there's embedded assessments at the end. Those assessments are smart assessments, so that if you didn't get that concept right, it goes back and rewrites the chapter. Oh. And it says, you know what? We didn't present it the right way. This isn't how you learn. That's the textbook that we need to build, right? And so content can change, technology can change, but this is all based on where we, as innovators, and you, as leaders, come together and say, where do we want to take this, right? And what's the why? And so, at the end of the day, um, I think content is really the king of all this. The free content will continue to push, and it has to be a part of your strategy to say, how do we take advantage of free content? Also, you have to look at open source books, e-books, how they go with the piece of this, the <coughs> $9 billion industry that is the current textbook industry. And then, where are states going, those major adoption states and some of the things I talked about? But the major piece here is whether we innovate or we replace. Do we take the innovations of the digital world and we replace it with the same economy, or do we completely transform it? And the same will be true <coughs> that she talks about when she talks about transforming learning. Because we've tried this in many different ways over the past several decades, right? We've taken devices, we've taken content, and we've tried to change the modicum that is one to many. And even online learning schools originally just substituted. They picked up and they said, we're just going to do one to many, right? We'll take the pedagogy of the classroom and we'll put it online. There's nothing transformative about that, right? And you have the same bell curve of adoption rates. Students that get it, get it. Those that don't, don't. Nothing's personalized, let's move on, right? But what Apple was interested in is what happens when you bring the devices down and you bring down the technology and you change the way the content can interact with the technology, what happens, and we found, we can personalize learning with the help of teachers who are ready to take that next step, right? Because the role of the teacher changes. And my favorite example is called Carpe Diem High School in Yuma, Arizona. And Carpe Diem is a blended learning environment. It started out as a charter school who lost the funding for their lease for their building. The building manager said, we're out. You're out, see you later, I'm selling the building, right? So this school is sitting there saying, what do we do? We only have X amount of dollars. And what they ended up doing was they ended up walking into a new building and said, we're just going to reinvent education, right? We're going to start off with the concept that we're going to have six master teachers. They had 20 classroom teachers, just like any other 500 student school or whatever. Now there are six teachers that are going to be master instructional strategists. We're going to take all those things I just talked about, the innovations in textbooks, the innovations in free content, and they're going to put together personalized curriculums. They're going to put together master instructional plans for these students. And oh, by the way, during the day, these students are going to blend between an online environment and a center atrium and individual group instructions on the outside, and they're going to flip traditional learning. And Matinga's going to talk about this, actually, where homework becomes group work, class work, and content sit and get becomes the online component. And we change the budget, we change the framework. Now, the cool thing is, at the end of the day, they ended up building another building, and they built it for half the amount that the same 500 student high school was built just down the road for a traditional model. So they really re-engineered what we can do in these environments, but they did it by focusing on teaching and learning. So I encourage you to pick up the rise of K-12 blended learning uh, put out by the Innocite Institute. It's a series of short papers. 
It discussed this exact question of transformation versus substitution. It discussed things like Carpe Diem. You'll even see some Michigan schools in there. It discussed over 40 different models for blended learning. And it looks at what does it take to really get to that transformation phase? And what are the dangers if we just go the route of saying, yeah, let's go online, right? Let's cut the funding, go half price, push them online, and go out the door, right? Did we change anything inside of that? And how do we create a culture of innovation? So Apple's best lesson is, rather than sit here and try to decide where is technology going, right? You're not going to figure that out. Is really to say, we're going to create our future. We're going to invent it. And we're going to create the next school. And then we're going to require the rest of these guys, the Apples, the Googles, the publishers, to create the environments to make it work. But, but really, that's the way <coughs> we look at it. And that's the way that, uh, fortunately, I think, um, is, the, is the best way to lead Michigan forward in this point. So my basic leave behind for you is really three areas. And that is, there are ways that you, as a state, leaders in education can take this conversation further than Apple or even any individual district, right? And the way is, you bring in the publishers, you bring in those you've been working with for years and years, and you say, I see you're doing these things in other states, what can we be doing here? We may not be a state adoption state, but what we can do is create educational content options that help transform teaching and learning locally that schools can plug into, whether they be like the Beyond Textbook Initiative, whether they be four or five pilot applications around uh, some of our top textbooks in the state. And also, blended learning, are we focusing on transformation? And I think if you put those three pieces together, uh, it's a good start in what is a crazy new world. So I'll turn that over now to Matinga, who's really going to get into the, the nuts and bolts. Thanks, David. Yep. I'll go right to Matinga. While Matinga is shifting over, I do want to say that Bruce Umstead and Linda Ford, Sally Vaughn, they brought a lot of leadership to this in our own house, as you know, and some of what David was referring to, and uh, maybe we'll have some chances for follow-up uh, down the line on that, on the specific things here in the department. <coughs> really like the uh, transform, don't substitute. That's a great way to think about this. Thank you. Matinga. One second. I just got to... Okay, we got a good count on these iPads too, so uh, they're going to give us a live demo. Uh, they don't know how these things walk out the door. How many you just gave away? <laughs> I did present the legislature last year, and I just have seen the ones like sort of wandering around. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, David talked a lot about a lot of different things really fast. <laughs> and um, I don't know if that's an Apple thing or what, but I talk fast too. Um, I'll also tell you I have an ear infection, so I don't hear very well today. So if you can't hear me, I sound really loud in my head. <laughs> and if you can't hear me, let me know. And if I don't hear you, please <coughs> let me know. But I'm just going to go through a few of the things that he kind of talked about about content so that you can kind of see. I don't know, there's a few people I saw in here that have iPads, but if you haven't had a chance to kind of play with one, it's hard to understand that concept of the, uh, the iPad is the content, unless you kind of get to see that. So I'm going to show you just a few examples, and then just give you a little time to kind of play with it. So uh, a little bit about the hardware. Um, there is one button on the face of the iPad. That is what's called the home button. And if you press it, it'll wake it up. And then there'll be a slide bar that you can use. Now, it, you ha it's looking for skin. So you have to touch it with your finger to move that. And you slide it, and it will open up. Now, the, the, you'll probably be on the main page. A couple things. The internet here is a little bit touchy. So it may or may not connect for you. Um, but we won't need it for today. Um, so if you look on this main page, there's several apps that are there. They're just kind of general apps. The way this iPad is set up is so that there's kind of different curriculum areas on each page. So it's like a book in that when I turn, want to turn the page, I just swipe like I were turning a page from left to right, right to left. 
And if I rotate this, it will rotate the screen. Now, some apps will require it to be in landscape mode uh, be just because of the, lap, the way the app is laid out. Oh, no. So, um, and I'll show you a couple of different apps too so you can kind of get a feel for those. Um, but so if you kind of swipe through, you'll see there's different <laughs> curriculum areas. And well, I'm going to show you just a couple of real quick um, pieces of content so you can see. First thing I want to show you is something from iTunes U. And um, just because you may or may not know what that is. So it's actually the one I want to show you. iTunes U content can go in a couple of different places depending upon what it is. If it's a podcast, it's going to go in the iPod. So um, there's lots of content from iTunes U that's simply a podcast. There's also content that's video content. So the first thing I want to show you is video content. So on the first page, if you're not on the first page, if you tap that home button once, it'll take you to the home page. If you tap it again, <coughs> it's the first window. So just tap it till you get the icon. And then you'll see up here in the upper left an icon called videos. And you just tap on that, and there will be a whole list of videos that have been downloaded from iTunes U, and you can kind of scrub through and see them. And there's different ones depending. Now, I gave you each a set of earbuds. Those are yours to keep. Um, it's a lovely parting gift. It's a gift. And also, we don't want them back. No. <laughs> Those are yours to keep. If you'd like, if they work with a cell phone because they have a, a microphone in them, what that's really I great for is if you need to use this with literacy issues, a lot of schools are using it where they have the students record their content and then they can immediately hear themselves read back. And so it's really helping with literacy and fluency, so much so that in some schools, um, they're seeing four to five times what's considered normal progress. And so in six-week time periods, they've got students that are catching up to their normal reading speeds. And so they're seeing some great things. Um, but if you look through here, there is one icon that I want you to look for, and it says course image. I don't think it downloaded quite correctly, and that's why it says course image, but it's just a white block. And if you tap on that, um, if you plug the earphones into the top, you can hear it through the headphones. It's in the, in the top. There's one little port. Or you can hear it through the speakers. If you can't hear it well or it's too loud, on the right side, there's a volume up and a volume down. It's a long button, and if you press the upper side of it, it'll volume up or press the lower, and it'll volume down. But when you get to this, if you just tap on that icon, this is a video from Khan Academy. It's free content from iTunes U. It's about, about the French Revolution. French. Khan Academy has a tremendous French amount of content for um, a lot of different curriculum areas. A lot of math, a lot of algebra, um, but they've also got some other stuff. So this will be from the history section, and it's about the Industrial Revolution. So Solomon Khan started these videos that he was teaching his niece and nephew in another country uh, about math. And so he decided he would create these videos, and he put them online on YouTube, and now he's made them available uh, via iTunes use. So they're really, really great. So as you're listening to the content, and I'm not going to let you listen to the whole thing, um, it's available if you have iTunes use. But if you just tap on the screen, there's a pause button that will show up at the bottom. And then in the upper right, or upper left, excuse me, you can press done, and it will put that away. And then you can press the home button, and it will take you back to the main screen. So that is an example of content that would be from iTunes U. Another example of content from iTunes U that would actually be a podcast um, in the bottom, across the bottom of your iPad, there's an orange icon called iPod. And if you tap on that, this is another series of podcasts that are available, and, or content that's available from iTunes U. And if you just look, the very first one should be The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Now, on the left-hand side, it has to be tapped on iTunes U. So if you don't have iTunes U highlighted, you won't see the list. So make sure it says iTunes U here. And then just look at Huckleberry Finn or the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a chapter book. So you would obviously download individual chapters. I only downloaded the first chapter. Um, and so if you tap on that, you'll start hearing it. The really great thing about this, it's an audio book. It's created by a group of students out of the University of South Florida who are looking to go into teaching, and they want to have content available. <coughs> so they have this project called lit to go where they take books that are beyond copyright and do an audio book of them. But if you tap on the screen, the beautiful thing is they also put the text there. So if you have a non-reader, a choose student who either chooses not to read or severely dyslexic or whatever reason they won't read, they can actually see the text. Now, you can't increase the size of the text on this screen. When you look at a blended learning environment, a teacher really, really has to consider the best tool for the job. And in this case, the tool is really about audio. It's not about the text. But having the text there is very beneficial in an education setting in that if I have a student that can read, they just choose not to, I can maybe trick them into reading it. 
while they're listening to it, maybe. So that's um, the University of South Florida's Let's Go, and I'm going to have you stop that as well. So if you tap on the screen in the upper right corner, you'll see a pause button, and then just press the home button. So that's another example of content, and that's, again, free content from iTunes U. So those are just a couple of examples of really great content that are being put out by uh, universities and colleges and what we call our Beyond Campus section. Um, I want to show you a couple of different other applications. I'll show you one from Language Arts, and then I'll show you Social Studies, and then I'll turn it over to Matinga to do her um, talking. But if you look on the very first page, or not the very first page, because that's the main page. But if you go to the second page, these are um, applications that are primarily language arts focused. And one of them is the second one over is called S I B R and J, which stands for Shakespeare and Bits, Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> and probably everybody in here read Romeo and Juliet. This is one of the apps that um, requires you to be in landscape mode because of the way the program is laid out. Now, I was a language arts teacher, and I taught Shakespeare, or I taught, no, I taught Shakespeare, or I taught Romeo and Juliet every year. And to, um, if you look at this, um, if you tap on the play, uh, I really like this app because I think it's really important and it's really hard to do in, in a classroom. A play is a visual medium. It was always intended to be seen. It was intended to be heard. It was not intended to be read. It was nice that they wrote it down so that it carried on through history. But it was really intended to be seen. And normally in a classroom setting, you don't watch the play. You get students to try to read the parts. But with Shakespeare, of course, you're stumbling over the language. I can't understand those words. And so there's all kinds of reasons why that doesn't work. So if I can give them a visual medium where they can watch the video, then it helps them understand. So over here on the right-hand side, you'll see the text. On the left-hand side, you see a little video. And if you tap that little play button, it'll start playing the video. Now, as it plays the video, it highlights the text that it's reading. So I know exactly where I am in the story. And it will just continue to go page to page if you've got it set to auto flow. But you'll notice there are certain words that students have trouble with. So for example, um, <coughs> break forth, or break to new mutiny, or for forth the fatal loins. Those words are, were common in Shakespeare's time, not so common today. So if you don't understand them, you just tap on it, it changes it to words that would be more common today. And so you can understand. There's also these little tags on the um, left-hand side of the text that are L, H, and T for the language, the history, and the theme. And so it kind of talks about different things with Shakespeare. So I'm going to stop the play here. I'll just pause. So if you tap on the uh, animation and tap that, it'll stop the play. And then across the bottom, if you look at the button, that, uh, the one that's called cast, so across the very bottom of the screen, you'll see cast. And if you tap on that, it shows you each individual character and what they'll see. So if you see them visually, you know that that's Romeo. Over on the left, it shows you who their associates are. And so if you're, well, what does Friar Lawrence look like? You can tap on that. It will jump to information about Friar Lawrence. And if you want an entire relationship map of everybody that's there, in the, <coughs> in the far upper right corner, there it says relationship map. And if you <laughs> tap on that, it will take you to a map of all the individuals who are in the play and how they're related to each other and how they connect. So it's a really nice way to teach um, the content. The students get the visual as they need it. There's some students that do fine with reading it. They can do it that way. Um, but it gives you all these different um, features and functionality that's built into that. So I think it's, I think it's really a powerful, powerful application. So that's, um, and if you press the home button, it'll take you out of that app. So um, let's see. The other power in, in this is that if you're going to reinvent content, it was important for us to make sure we looked at all learners. So whether you're visually or hearing impaired, in built into this device from the operating system up is all the assistive technology that used to cost $1,500, $2,000 to add to your environment. It's in this device out of the box. You're a completely blind person. You pull an iPad out of the box, hold down the home button. It will turn voice around, realize you're blind, and completely re-engineer itself to work with you. That was important for us. Yeah, can I ask a question? I, I'm going to show my absolute stupidity on this. I've never touched yeah. one of these, although you may not get this back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, if, if you are to, it, and I'd love the concept of you creating the con you creating your world with the content that's available rather than content that creating a space for you to access it. I love that idea. If I were a person who purchased one of these and wanted to create my world for my classroom, my, uh, I don't know, my after school group, my whatever it was, 
can you access everything from here, or do you have to download it from somewhere else first? No, everything can come from there. So you, I'm on the settings page here. Is that where you get everything? Well, the App Store is where we run our apps through. A lot of apps are web-based apps, which means okay. you just go to the website and it appears as an app. And those run on multiple devices. But essentially, it's set up to create an environment for, yes, you can access anything, anywhere, as long as you're, you're connected online. Okay. So if I want to go on the internet, I've got internet. You can get your Angry Birds, I think. I don't think it's oh, okay, I have it. <laughs> I don't think the internet's for it. It's, it's on and off, but I keep having to authenticate. So um, you can go on the internet and just do internet stuff if you want. If you find, if you want to look and see what apps are available, I could do that on my computer and transfer them to the iPad, or I can just go on the iPad to the App Store and look and see and, and browse search. through that. You can search in the iPad and App find Store. it. Yeah, or if there's you know content from iTunes U, I can just download it directly from iTunes U. I don't have to have another device. But do you, if if you have online learning currently from another source, uh -huh. can you get the online learning here? Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Well, it depends on the online It depends on how it's put up there okay. and how it's configured. So it, it really does, in theory, yes. In reality, it depends on how they published it. And if sure. they did something proprietary, it may not work. We, s we focus on standards and stick to standards. So as long as they, as they followed standards, then it should work perfectly fine. But if it's a proprietary thing, I, I can't guarantee it will work. No, that's right. I'm just I, I'm yeah. just trying to get a grasp yeah. on. But the majority of stuff you would find on the web should be pretty available readily. So this available. is a purchase program over like an MVU. Right. Um, that it would work. Yeah. yeah. That it would work. Yeah. Let's okay. Go to Thank you. Let's go to Matinga's uh, thing, and then we'll, we'll jump back. Yeah. But let's go to Matinga's. Thank you, because we're gonna we want to make sure we're within our time. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, you can play later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just uh, to start with that, I want to thank you guys um, a million for <coughs> allowing me to um, present today and also to p speak on behalf of teachers trying to innovate um, education system for the 21st century. So I was going to piggyback on what Dave just uh, presented and I wanted to show you what this looks like in the classroom now. Um, I'm hoping to present today just uh, just elements. This is just one model of many. I guess you can see there's the, the possibilities are endless. Um, so it's just a w w elements of one successful blended model. And I also want to uh, caution you to start with the, the, uh, the fact that, you know, this is not, and like David said, it's not a concept that can be layered over uh, an, an aging foundation. And this is definitely transformative. And there's a huge cultural, uh, it's a cultural attack on our beliefs, I guess. You know, it's, you really have to think of the things that we thought this is the way we learn are completely upside down. And now we call it, we com they're completely flipped. So as a teacher, I've, uh, I've had to really flip my classroom. So I'm going to show you what this looks like in person. Yeah. So uh, before we dive in, it's very important to understand um, that <coughs> because of all the technology, all the sources out there, it's very difficult as teachers today and as, as institutions for us to actually figure out, okay, what is it that we're going to purchase? What is it that we're going to do? And what we have end up having is um, just a lot of vanity pieces in our schools where, you know, a teacher or an administrator can walk around going, well, we've got one of these in every classroom, but we don't really know what to do. And so it's very important. And so, so I created just for my own self, simply when I go to McCall, I don't die of, you know, my, of just angst. I created a simple, <laughs> a, a simple rubric of how I go about choosing, and uh, hopefully this will help also in, in the decisions when it comes to technology acquisition. And so I have a, a technology that is not disruptive and puts effortlessly onto an everyday uh, lesson. Uh, some of the technology that we get as teachers is not efficient. It does not, you know, it takes a lot of instructional time out just to set things up and set the router working and all of this stuff. And so it's very important that we think about that when we choose a technology. And the technology that improves the lesson and promotes learning. There's a lot of fun stuff to do out there, fun apps and fun little gadgets. But is it actually going to, are the students going to learn anything at the end of their um, uh, you know, practice with this particular tool? Technology that, in that increases students' performance, uh, student learning, student employability skills, motivation and self-management. And this is very controversial because, you know, you end up <coughs> having to accept some of the things that we have kind of put at bay. For example, I was very shocked to see that you cannot get a marketing job, a business job these days without ne uh, experience in network, mar uh, like in, uh, network um, uh, networking 
or uh, you know, if you don't know how to run a Facebook, if you don't know how to run a, uh, a you know, any of the, the, the networks out there, um, you cannot get a marketing job. So employability skills, uh, it's very important to understand that the tool has to be able to allow the student to do that. Um, technology that's relevant to students. Now, the laptop is our technology thing. I mean, adults, <coughs> we carry around laptops, but it's rare that you see a student with a laptop. Um, and so, you know, for some of us who don't have access to one-to-one, -to -one, you know, cell phones, you know, gaming system, anything that can get them online is basically anything in their pocket has become basically our platform. Um, so sometimes we're putting some of the technology and spending millions of dollars in technology that is not relevant to them, and that's why they, it does not work as well. And finally, uh, a technology that promotes technology. Um, as you can see, for example, this tool that you saw today is a platform. There are many, many different platforms that we can deliver the content to the students, but a, a platform that is not top heavy. If I look at my laptop, my laptop is for the business world. It's got a lot of things that I don't even know how to use, and I love technology. Um, but you look at something like an iPad or an iPhone or some of the smartphones, um, you know, they are customizable. So, um, like Nancy was saying, you know, you know, can I just go and get the stuff that I want? Yeah, you go to the app store and just like in a grocery store, you pick up the stuff that you want, mm -hmm. put it in a, in, a, in a cart and you take it home. And it's definitely, um, uh, it promotes technology because it's not attached to anything and it really brings the idea of anywhere, <coughs> anyhow, learning. Mm -hmm. So it's a very simple rubric, but for me, it's, it's because I have a very a terrible attention span, it's made it very, very easy to go to technology conferences, to learn new technology, because I can just say yes, no, yes, and no. Um, um, a simple integration plan that um, a teacher needs to basically put this technology into, into um, life is a learning management system of some sort for a teacher point of view. Now, as students start becoming more uh, more knowledgeable and start creating their own apps, it will be really interesting to see what kind of platform a teacher needs to actually support the apps, to share the students' the apps for their own learning. So you need a learning management system or a blog or wiki, some place where you can put all of the, the places that the, you want the students to go online, um, just kind of to funnel their time online. Uh, one of the things that's very important that we always forget to do is to provide what I call professional development for students. This is a cultural change for students as well. Just because they um, are knowledgeable about the te technology, for them technology is not the same as for us. And uh, you know, they know how to game, they know how to go to Facebook, but they don't know um, how to learn from, uh, um, or, or how to do school from their gadgets as well. So it's very important, sorry. Yes. My x-rays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was looking at your ask you that was your yeah. <laughs> you did anything, Yeah, there you go, right. Yeah. So, so it's very important to, to train the students. And I know as teachers, we spend the first week of school just giving them the do's and don'ts list. We all remember those. But it comes up, it, it, you know, uh, um, a blended in, uh, learning environment becomes more of an orientation like you would if you had McDonald's jobs. This is what you do. Um, you have to create a connection a social connection and a network for the students. Now, uh, something like this, this is just an exercise app. Um, most of these apps are also networks, they're also social networks, so they can share with other people. I mean, I have my uh, uh, Exercise Pal, which is an uh, uh, application on my cell phone. And so I have people looking at whether I exercise today and what I ate because I am using uh, myfitnesspal.com. Um, or oh, my fitness pal app on my, my cell phone, <laughs> so that's just to keep, me, to keep me honest. So they become social networks, so this, the application, um, so, so you, can, uh, you can see as I'm speaking how the, the, the education, the, like the classroom has to start shifting. Um, also, one of the things that is very crucial to the integration plan is the willingness to synchronize the current classroom model with the education possibilities. And like Dave said, you can't just paint, you can't just stack the, every, like the tradition with the, with the new technology, we really have to start from scratch or at least um, really think about things a different way. And um, online content for a typical online classroom looks like this. It's, you know, you've got a calendar, you've got a commons area for, you know, for the students to, to 
to be in. Um, you've got a place to put all your course information, extra resources, a place that they can customize and they have access to customized resources. This is great for differentiating instructions, a place where the children can publish their own stuff, and a place where they can collaborate, and a place where they can do their testing. So it's very, very simple. There are just a couple of tabs, and it looks really complicated from the outside. But from the inside, as a teacher, that's basically all I need. And I put that on a website, and we're good to go. Um, but these few points that I gave you give incredible possibilities. And uh, um, now, for example, my, my school uses um, uh, Blackboard. They'll be moving to Moodle next year, but Blackboard has a Blackboard app. So you just go to the Blackboard app, and everything the teachers put online is right there on your fingertips. So professional development for students. And it's very important that we take this opportunity to not just shift the way the students learn, but to create an environment that we've been wanting to have for a long time. Um, and I think that the technology kind of gives us that freedom to actually also tweak a lot of the things that have kind of gotten away from us from, uh, you know, in the traditional education. So the, you, you te they teach the students how to study and learn in the classroom, not just what, you know, when do you go to the bathroom, where you turn things in, you have to teach them how to study and learn in this particular class, not in Mrs. Smith's class, but in this particular class. Um, you have to use tools that are relevant and tell them why they're relevant. You know, we put them in front of a, a tech, like a tech gadget and we, if the student is asking you, why is it that I have to do this? And you cannot answer, you have to really consider why you're teaching that in the first place. Um, and most importantly, uh, to you know, teach them the skills that they need to succeed in this class. Um, and these are skills that are not necessarily academic. Um, I found in my class that teaching culture, um, and like we use um, um, character, charactercounts.org. Teaching character um, with the technology lends to a completely different individual. Remember, the kids are coming in wanting to sit in rows, and being immature is part of the oh, expectation. But now if you're teaching, uh, uh, you know, together with the technology or the access or the content that you're seeing online, um, you're also teaching a character, uh, using it as a platform of character development, it becomes a very, very powerful tool. And one of the things that we've not been doing, at, at least from a point of view as a teacher, is, you know, b basically teaching the kids to just make it happen. One of the most exciting things for an immigrant to see in this country is how Americans just make things happen <coughs> like magic. It's just crazy. You just, you know, if nobody can figure it out, an American can figure it out. <laughs> and so basically, this is what we, <laughs> we think with outside. So basically what we're teaching the kids is just, you know, just make it happen. And the way that you make it happen is with these tools that we can provide for you. So I'm no longer the person that's going to tell you how to do it. You have to learn how to do it and then you know, I am the one that's going to help you make the connections. Um, so now, uh, there's a real-world window that this, these gadgets provide. Um, one of the things that I do, and these are some things that I have added up <coughs> that makes my classroom more real-world. And you also have, you will have a, a copy of this PowerPoint. I was hoping that as I was talking, you should, I had a chance to interact with the PowerPoint, but the internet is iffy, so I, you know, I, I didn't want to uh, disrupt the presentation. But um, you can see that, like in a in a real world, I put a, a weekly newsletter, so it's very easy for the parents to check into the classroom, and you have a lot of transparency. Uh, an, an administrator can uh, click at a button, just see what is happening in my uh, in your in. Um, uh, my class or in another math class and when a parent com com comes complaining you can just touch a button and say well no that is not what they did this week or whatever so I have an e-newsletter and if you look at the e-newsletter it's very interactive it's got previews to the movies that we're going to watch it's got all kinds of stuff and also one of the things that you know it's this uh, technology like the blended classroom has allowed me to do is to just kind of run the place like a business almost and as a teacher, I'm now like almost like a business manager. Like, a, you know, I, I come in and I can have the staff meetings at the beginning of Monday. Just these are the things that you're going to have to do today. And I don't have to write it on the board. I don't have to do endless reminders because they're all at the tip of their, you know, their hands right there. And so um, in individual group assessments are possible with technology. And those are things that used to take me a lot of time to grade. Weekly personnel reviews and evaluations. Now the need for section managers, kind of like what the choirs have. You know, when you have, when you're running a classroom almost like a business, you know, more than five staff is already, you know, you need uh, one to five 
manager employee ratio and so you appoint section managers and so kids who are going to be running things um, in the classroom as well because remember the classroom has been fl flipped I'm no longer the source of information so me standing in the front of the room has become completely irrelevant um, in, uh, uh, allowing uh, you know employee surveys all the time again you just go online you put up a survey and the kids can quickly and absolutely either crush your weekend or, or <laughs> elevate you a little, you know, they're brutally honest. And then, of course, uh, the performance reports are made by the students or they're made by me, and they go to every stakeholder. And by stakeholder, I mean anybody who has anything to do with the, this child's success. So now if they read it, I don't know, but at least they have it in their hand. They have the weekly report, all of the things that you saw right here. And this I could not do if I had to do it longhand, if I had to type and, and, and photocopy and send these in their Friday folder. So now this, so the gadget is now their Friday folder, Tuesday folder, Monday folder, everyday folder. Um, some eight additions, very simple. Um, it's very important for them to provide, for, for them to have a social <coughs> network space. Now, I've tried different ones, and there's some controversy over providing social networks. And like um, uh, Daniel said really uh, eloquently, if, it does not, if you don't talk about it, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You know? And so there are social networks that students are using social networks. And I think that by you know, like killing some of these social network opportunities, we're really squandering an opportunity to teach an entire generation of students how to behave online. And so as a teacher, I find it my duty uh, as an adult to make sure that I'm there as a watchdog. And so if a student friends me, it's me, it's me understanding that, um, you know, you can't publish that because your mother can see that and they, don't, they understand that. And the social network has also become a quick way for a teacher to access a student. If, um, if, I ha if I'm grading a paper, the, if I'm grading and you know, Charlie's got a zero, again, I just open a chat box and I know Charlie's on Facebook. Charlie, are you tired of living? <laughs> Why aren't you taking your online quiz? And it's very simple. And Charlie's like, oh, no, my bad. And then the quiz is taken in the next half an hour. And it's in a completely different universe. Um, and if it's not me, it's whatever section manager is, you know, like on Charlie. It uh, provides a real audience, uh, real life collaboration, uh, research and information space, especially writing. Students, uh, their, their writing improves dramatically and their performance dramatically when they know that it's not just their kind, teacher that is going to be looking at their work, there's some uh, real audience out there, especially if it's an audience of their peers. Now this brings to the discussion some of the things that we have thought, thought, well, no, you can't put this out in the open because you're going to make this child feel bad. So and I know in my classroom we've had some of these conversations, well, what, do you ha what happens when a child feels bad about his performance? Well, like in the real world, you just go back to square one, square one and you rinse and repeat. You could not do that if I had to do it longhand. I could not reteach that to that student until he got it. So, you know, syndicated writing is incredible because a student can just go back, you can't break the internet, delete, 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 start over. Um, of course, you have to provide an assessment tool and multiple, multiple chances of success. I'm going to speak really fast so I can get through all the stuff. So, um, one of the things that uh, blended environment provides for me is a flexible learning platform. So everything is a la carte, kind of like a huge buffet including the way I deliver things. So now I am no longer the delivery platform, at least not the only delivery platforms. You can see by all of these apps that um, the students can get their content elsewhere. <coughs> so what happens is content they get on their own in these really cool um, apps, and then they come to class, and in class we do discussion, we do um, demonstrations, we do p special speakers on Skype, and we do things that are going to uh, uplift the lecture and really understand whether or not they, or get, uh, get me to understand whether they got the content or not. Same with assignments. Assignments can no longer be one size fits all. They have to be a la carte. And of course, assessments must be a la carte, which is something I, you know, we need to consider also as we prep them for standardized um, <coughs> testing. Because if everything else that they're doing is a la carte, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there's a screeching halt at the standardized test, as imaginative as the standardized tests have become, you know, there is room for innovation in that, in that concept as well. Um, really quickly. Are Pearson and those sorry. folks helping break through this standardized test thing since they're so, yeah. sorry to interrupt, that no, that no, no, to no. that point that Matinga is making? They are working with the states on, the, on, on those projects from the federal level, and, and yes, those are the same folks that are working on new content waves, so we hope that 
uh, some innovation. Which means you can great do point. the testing online. Is that what you're talking about? We, yeah, I mean, standardized testing, absolutely. And then we'd like to see more mini assessments embedded in the content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So. right. Please, Mateng, I'm sorry. Yeah. So there's a, just a quick example of a a la carte assignment. So we've got uh, the objective of this assignment, and uh, you know, it's just to show understanding of the material in Chapter 24, Section 1. So we've got three students. We've got Aubrey, Sophia, and Abbott. And uh, Aubrey, although she's very young, she reads at the 12th grade level. So she just likes to do the unit reading. She, she goes online, and she just gets all the reading uh, portions, and she's done. And then Sophia, she's artistic. She likes the graphic organizer, and like, she likes to do a, a, a short presentations because she likes to show off her graphic organizer, what she's done in glitter. You know, and so Sophia will have some time in class <coughs> to talk about his presentation. And then Abed, you know, he has, you know, really strict Indian parents and he needs to have show like paper homework. So he gets the reading guide and he gets the podcast notes, so he's got that and that's how he works. Now, as long as the students are achieving, uh, are succeeding in the assessment, now why does Aubrey have to do the unit reading, the reading guide, the graphic organizer, the section questions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Every, every teacher has a student or a couple of students that they are always apologetic to in the back of the room because the student is like, are you kidding me? You're doing this again? And it's like it shouldn't be. Now there's no reason to do that. And so now these students become, they have different roles in the classroom. And I'm hoping in your minds you can see that the classroom is no longer, we can't sit in rows and have one person, one person performing at the same, you know, at once anymore. So uh, this becomes a logical conclusion uh, since there are so many different ways to attain the same exact content. Um, so differentiated instruction, voila. So now once you have this information, you know, you can click on all of the PowerPoint presentation. It's all interactive. But I wanted to show you there are different things that we do in class that uh, prompt for the students to be their own teachers and me to be like the challenge maker. Um, so, for example, in this one, there's the, the challenge is called, you know, rebirth of what? And so the students click on this, and they're, out, they're immediately transformed or taken to, and I can see if I can play it, I'm not sure. Um, they're taken to the Sistine Chapel. Right, so, so then not just that, can they, so this is the picture of the Sistine Chapel, and I've been to Sistine Chapel, I've taken students to Sistine Chapel, and you can never, ever get as close as this. So you can actually navigate the Sistine Chapel wow. and you can get a little closer and study it up close. So you send them in here for a challenge, whatever it is. I mean, you can completely Da Vinci code this entire uh, <laughs> uh, assignment and the students can come up with all kinds of stuff. So they do that. They can actually take pictures of it very simply. They can just find their favorite little picture or an example of what they want to do and quickly take a picture of the, what they want to want, want to sh show me and make a project out of this. So this is what a challenge looks like. One second, let me find where I am. Oops. Yeah. And so another thing that they can do is uh, create uh, uh, trailers for their uh, for their own presentations. Now in my class, students come in, and again, this is just one of many models. Um, they prepare presentations by going and doing research, and I have given parameters. And then they come in and they choose, uh, students can choose what presentation they want to hear. So they will have either online or on a board, they can quickly go ahead and pick out the presentation they want to hear and the presentation they will meet in small groups and learn whatever the, that person is presenting, all within the chapter, all within the unit, all within the, the standards. So these are all examples of what they can do. Also, they have a student legacy is when they get to do the content, the online content, content themselves. So this one here is a student prepared the, a trailer to just kind of get kids um, to come and watch his presentation, and it's done with Animoto, and I'm not going to spend the time. You can actually look at it later. And then this one is just a, a, a bunch of fifth graders doing a uh, student presentation, and I'm not sure if my sound works, so I'm kind of hesitant to play it. Oh, it works this way. Why doesn't it work this way? Oh, anyway. But uh, this is a bunch of uh, third, uh, fifth graders who have created content to teach percentages. Real quick, let me grab. Yeah. I'm just going to take that out. <coughs> And there's tons of these, and the tons of teachers are making their students go online. I'm just going to play a little bit of it. Hi, welcome to 
finding for sense with pop. Oh, shoot. And I just did. No, I, I um, actually shut it down, so sorry. Oh. All right. Here comes. <coughs> So as you can see, so you don't have to assign homework anymore. You know, before a problem like this so would take seven minutes per problem, this will take a student an hour to do, and he's done percentages of in his head 50 times over just to prepare this, you know, two-minute presentation for his classmates, which is also, uh, you know, a forever project. And then the next thing we do is find 1% of 40. A really easy way to do this is to move the decimal point in 40 two spaces to the left. So that would get you point four. Anyway, so you can you can look at it, but it's just uh, again a, a student legacy option that they you know they can create the, the the projects and their posters no longer lay in the bottom of my trash can at the end of the semester. They're now online forever, and any student can use that. Um, let's see what else I want. So here's so assessment a la carte. Here is the part that has become very interesting to me as an educator. So for me, you know, again, um, tests are no longer punitive. They cannot be punitive. So I had to come up with a completely different way of testing the students and understanding whether or not, uh, uh, understanding assessment. So if tests and quizzes are meant to be a learning tool, then the student has to come into the test knowing less than going out of the test. So when they leave the test, they should know more if it's really to be a, um, uh, a learning tool. And I'm going to go as fast as I can. It has to be, a co you know, so I use collaborative <coughs> testing and quizzes, and I use multiple attempts, and I also have the students take the test to their convenience since they have the gadgets with them. And this makes it so that, this, you know, it eliminates um, um, test anxiety in much ways. A lot of times students that have text an test and anxiety, they don't understand when they read a question. We'll make it a collaborative <laughs> test. You give them a test buddy, and the test buddy can read through, and they can actually collaborate, and they can really learn how to chew on a question and get the cor correct answer. And I'll show you how that, what that looks like. So online assessment allows me to do all of this. There is no way I could, ha I could grade. No, I would not grade a test three times. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, but online assessment, I can have that test open for seven days, and you just go, and, I, and I, the same questions, same questions, because these are now specific things that I want you to cover, as opposed to, um, oh, here's some fat and jelly, and just kind of 100 point test, just because I can't. Um, so uh, it's made me as a teacher a lot more concise, and I've el eliminated a lot of the redundancies that I realized I had when I just had the regular traditional tests. Um, real quick, I want to show you, um, so this, this is what a, collaborative tests look like. So there's two students and they're, you know, writing an essay and the essay is asking him to take a position. This is a world history class. And now world history is traditionally a dusty, really boring class. And so collaborating on something like that makes it so that we can use history as what it was, I think, intended, which is a blueprint for um, decisions that we have to make in the present and in the future rather than just something you put on the shelf. And so I want to show you what a class, you know, on video, what, I, what the um, class movement is like. So here in this, in this picture, um, the students are taking an online test. Now we have a traditional lab, and the lab, is, again, is set up in a traditional way, which is in rows, uh, facing the teacher. And so the way, if I have to stand in the front, I can't see what they're seeing. So already we have a, a low disparity there. So they're talking, they're actually taking a quiz, because what's important now is for them to understand, to, to actually get the facts. I don't really care whether you get the facts, whether it's from your friend, or from your parents, or from Google. You just have to get the facts, so that I know that you've covered that. And then, um, this is online testing. And then also part of the, part of the uh, learning procedure is the presentations. Now this is what presentations look like. They're no longer a child standing in the front of the room shaking and um, <laughs> presenting to 30 people. It's just a small group of kids who now will then rotate whenever they want to and uh, go to the next presentation. And this is when they're preparing for a test. And these kids are all preparing, you know, they present as they prepare for the test. 
And if you listen to my class, you know, and let me play that again, and I'll play it all together, because this is usually uh, something that, you know, and I grew up with nuns, you would never <laughs> have this. <laughs> and it's like almost music to the ear. Listen. So it's constant. There's no more, shh, shh, you know, be quiet. No, you know, it's constant. So the students are standing up and getting up. And this I could not do. And you can see we have one computer lab. So we don't have an excessive technology. And the computer lab you have to sign up for. for we have a hundred and some teachers that want that same computer lab at the same time. So you have to be really organized about getting it. And so the most of the time, I just survive on the gadgets that the students have in their pockets. And uh, you know, with one computer day a, a week, we, get, we manage to do all kinds of stuff too. So online, I will also have for you, um, uh, oh, this is an important part. Um, <laughs> love this poster, real quick, this is the conclusion. Teenagers, tired of being harassed by your parents? Act now, move out, get a job, pay your own way while well, you still know everything. You know, this, <laughs> is, <laughs> this is basically how, you know, I think my teenagers have ra been raised in the education system where it's like, you know, you just think you know everything. But the thing is, now they have a chance to prove to you. Actually, it's kind of cool because now we get to prove that they don't know anything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so to me, um, this particular platform, opening up technology, has uh, allowed me to teach the seven habits. And so the idea of being proactive, the idea of understanding, you can give the student the entire course in advance so the student understands where you're going and what's the point of this class. You can, um, un, uh, you know, help them put things first, or, you know, put first things first, win-win, because it's collaboration, synergize. All of these things are so important in our education um, platforms, and when we are just focusing sometimes on just the evaluation or the standardized testing, or, uh, you know, it becomes very difficult to teach all of these things. And um, I think, personally, as a teacher, and I don't speak for all teachers, if my students were to walk away from my classroom knowing absolutely no content, but understanding these um, standards or these particular points, to me that would be a, a, you know, a, a time worthwhile in my class, simply because you know, in the age of Google, you don't need to memorize pretty much anything, <coughs> you just look it up. But I think as long as you're proactive, you know where to, where to find the answer. As long as, long as you know how to plan ahead of time, you know how to get, to get there. So um, we use those as a platform. And I have also um, uh, a unit that I created for the, uh, so this one is on the, on the, uh, the Michigan.gov website. It's a um, hybrid unit that we created for um, this summer and that um, MDE's um, Understanding by Design for um, um, uh, planning, day, planning Week. And then we operate on that 40-40-40 philosophy. Students learn some things for 40, they, they return, retain, return, retain content for 40 minutes and that's usually for tests that they have to do and then they forget it for 40 you know, months, usually their high school career, or for 40 years. So now for me and for any teacher who's doing using technology, you can see that the content that the student is learning because they have so much time to chew on it in class is definitely for 40 years. So that's what I wanted to share and I hope you um, Thank you. Wow. get a better idea of what um, blended oh, environments geez. look like. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, let me thank you for this. This is so exciting, I can hardly sit here. Um, oh, but where do we get this power? This oh, I'll send it to you like what, the minute the mean, minute. The oh, unit I thought I'll maybe I was supposed to have gotten it and I couldn't <laughs> find no, no, it. No, I'll send it right to you. No, no. Okay, thank you very much for yeah, that. No problem. And then you can go through it, and it's all interactive, so if you put it on play, you can actually see it. I think what I see that's so exciting about this is this platform allows the anytime, anywhere, any place, any pace, allows a child to not have to worry about the 40 minutes of the classroom, mm. but rather I got this during this time, but now I can go home and I can get it here, and then I can go to the library and I can pick it back up here, and then I can go to the computer lab when I get back to school and kind of finish up a little bit here, and then right. go to someone else's, you know, uh, device here, and I know how to r get log into my site here, and I can, you know, yeah. there was something else I wanted to check out, and no more forgetting there, things in your locker. Well, and there's no there's no time limit nope. on t on a certain core content piece that it takes to learn it, access it, read it, whatever it is. Right. And so you can see how the, the bell becomes disru a disruption now. Now yeah. the bell rings and the kids are like, oh, come on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I get that. Mm -hmm. That's great. You know, I had asked Matinga to uh, divide time with me when I spoke to superintendents this year at their conference. And I thought you just 
sparked in so many of them. I mean, a lot of them are old like me. So for one thing, it's like they can't quite engage. And I've been able to have this for a while now. And you start to have glimpses of things that you can imagine, mm -hmm. but you can't until you actually experience it. Mm -hmm. And But I thought you really sparked. And, and those things you have to plan out. You know, like how do you start to spur the system into thinking differently and part of it is how do you get them to understand there's a whole other world out there that they just haven't seen yet and then you wonder about board's work on teacher prep implications I mean enormous um, have to be fast you know maybe not July 4th but you know but seriously how do we we just it's if you remember I think this this, the folks, the staff here was smart a couple of years ago in trying to say that we have to get the teacher prep institutions to understand technology and teaching and all that. Honestly, I don't think we've made much of a dent in that, and it would be one, having seen this today, that we really might want to prioritize, John, and, you know, thinking about some of the work that we've committed ourselves to. Because otherwise, it's, it's well-intentioned. I, I, I don't usually do this, but if I could start with the first question, just what, what percentage of teachers would you say kind of see it the way you're seeing it right now? Well, a, a, gro a growing percentage. I mean, I was just at the Edutopia Ed Camp just this weekend, and it was there must have been a hundred teachers there, and um, it's about a hundred thousand uh, teachers. Right. So, so there, are, there, it's a growing uh, group of teachers who are coming in, going, well, I just got to throw the book out, you know. And, and the, the interesting thing is that the toughest customers. Um, are not necessarily the parents or the other teachers, so other students, uh, especially the A students. They're like, what? No, where's the packet? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I already know the formula on how to get an A. Mm -hmm. And as long as we have this target, which is the A, um, I never have a student, a, a parent call me and say stuff like, um, you know, what is my child not learning in your class? It's always like, why is he failing? Why is he not getting an A? So the, we've got these little right. snags that are, you know, impeding the student's freedom to actually embrace this as, as quickly as they, sh they embrace, embrace other things. So, so implications teacher prep, implications for, uh, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but many suburbs build Taj Mahals that are images of old high schools that what mm -hmm. will they be like five years from now, not to Happy. mention the 60, they're intended to last half a billion dollars being spent in Detroit. I mean, there is a certain urgency to re to transforming, as David said, quickly before we kind of inst keep institutionalizing everything by training teachers four years at a, at a crack in the old ways and building buildings in the old ways and, you know, a lot of examples. Eileen, please. Eileen and Nancy, thanks for bringing this up. Yeah. Eileen and then, and then Marianne. I just want to thank Matenga and David. This is a, a new world for the board. It's one I've been looking at for quite a while, and you just made it come alive. It's wonderful. And I challenge Richard, who is sitting in on the Teacher of the Year um, evaluations on Thursday, to find another Matenga because <laughs> <laughs> the state desperately needs to have this message go forward. And I want to thank Elizabeth Bauer, who knows uh, nearly everyone in the country who's doing good things in digital and blended learning and led me to Dave. Um, and I also would like to say, again, and this is my mantra now for our meetings, is that this presentation should be on MEL as mm -hmm. a best practice um, a strategy and resource. And the last thing is that when I was talking earlier about the priorities of the board, this is my focus. If there are a way for you to play this at your hearings and be able to support this and show people what could be, it would be the best service we could do to Michigan. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Mary Ann, please. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you. And it's been a pleasure uh, playing with uh, <laughs> uh, Matinga. I'm uh, just so happy uh, you're here in doing this. <laughs> Um, I may have missed you saying this, but how how did all of your students have access to a iPad? They, they don't. Do they, they don't. They just. Or? I just have the one computer lab, and again, oh. you know, uh, you know, we feel like with the technology component, we cracked the egg. The egg's broken, and so uh, you know, we scramble to just make an omelet, make something. <laughs> and so, where there's a will, there's a way, and the students bring the gadgets in their pockets and. Hmm. Um, we're able to do it. Most of them have internet online. They say they don't, but it's like, hey, you got a Facebook? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Busted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. So they're almost all on Facebook. Yeah. So one question for David and one for Matinga. Um, so, Dave, big picture, what are the main things that the states that are moving most comprehensively doing that we need to understand? 
Well, there's two things. One is in Superintendent Flying Convention is, is speed. Um, states who are leading aren't waiting for the next study. They're not waiting for the next. Isn't they're saying, hey, we need to reinvent. We're going to reinvent now. And some of the things they're doing are a content that focuses on let's build the next textbooks, let's work with those industries and let's try to do that because then that freedom for the teacher and the student to sort of explore those routes. And the other piece is definitely on the side of um, their teacher professional development, their teacher training was solely focused on re-engineering that environment. And so there's sort of a two-step policy mechanism when you look at it from the state level. You're trying to provide freedom and opportunity to the local districts, but you're also trying to implement it across board. And so the third piece is they get rid of the silos. And unfortunately, we hire, we do this in districts and we do it at the state level. We hire technology people and we put them in one silo. And then we hire curriculum people and then we hire this. That's not how you reinvent nope. in a digital platform. And she kind of alluded to that. And so we have to look at that from our legislature to our state departments to everything and saying, we're not going to silo this out. So. And I think a very impressive. I'm oh, not thank surprised, you. but it's it's very educational. But small you. question: um, with the ability to customize for each <coughs> learner, as you showed, you know they are most comfortable or doing the reader or the mm -hmm. graphic person. Do you ever um, ask them to do something that is not their natural um, comfort to try to see if they can grow or stretch, or is it is it now the theory of the moment we should? No, no, and I to think to push the intelligences that they've got. Right, and, and I think uh, they they naturally gravitate towards you know like the students. I mean, like kids learn. You know, they they naturally push themselves. But you know, when you're trying to grade them for life in a project, and if I was doing a project that was my salary, say, like you know, I was getting paid for, I would get people that were components and elements for to make that project better. I wouldn't just get somebody who's trying to test their abilities, no, no, no. So um, students quickly understand, and if you give them an environment where they can fire people out of their group, it's like, you leech, no. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so you pretty much, ha you, it's really interesting because the students walk around like almost like with their curriculum vitae, like, can I please be in your group now? Oh, you know, and then they have to have the body of work <laughs> to prove that they can bring something to the table. It's real, it's the real world. Um, huh? Yeah. Thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, first of all, I want to thank you. It's really very informative mm -hmm. for one thing. It, it, things are moving so quickly that it's hard for me to keep up. <laughs> I don't keep up, but I have to, I'm trying to learn. But how do the how do the t kids operate in other classes? Do they transfer any of what they're learning in your class to other classes? Um, well, you know, as more and more teachers are adopting these ideas, you know. Um, in your school, I'm more and more Yeah, there, for example, we have uh, Lon Kappa, the, you know, in our science department, which is, uh, you know, science math um, issue now, STEM uh, initiatives are bringing mm -hmm. in all of these different ideas. And I think it's just a matter of time before more and more teachers start adopting this, because this is what happens is this system of teaching is very, very labor intensive. There's no more, oh, let's just give them some busy work so I can work on the grade. It just never happens because now you're a manager. You have to make sure that the tables are clean. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to walk around and, and manage. And so uh, more and more there's a necessity for the teachers to work as a team. Uh, for example, I give essay questions, but I am not, um, my, English is not my first uh, language, so I'm a terrible writer. And I always have to have my husband, who is a very good editor, look at my stuff before it goes anywhere. Um, uh, so. I can engage my English teacher and say, okay, why don't you do a quick podcast on how to, or, you know, screencast on how the elements that they need to have on an essay, throw it on my website, and then we have a really natural collaboration as opposed to, let's do this learning, learning, uh, we call it, learning communities, and then you put <laughs> people together, like you put somebody like me who can't sit still with somebody like a cave person who just doesn't mm -hmm. ever want to accept anything, and you don't get very far. <laughs> Um, and, and by cave person, I don't mean like Neanderthal. I mean like you know, citizens against virtually everything. You know? <laughs> 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 they don't. They don't. <laughs> we call those stones. <laughs> no, no, and, and no offense, but you know, you, you, you know, so you have to m bring just like in any productive team, you have to bring <coughs> people who are willing to work together for the common good. And uh, you'll see that when you shake the tree, a lot of these people who are <coughs> not. <coughs> Not quite with it yet, but well, they, you know, they, and I think they're going to adopt really quickly because most teachers are seeing this as a learning opportunity and, teach, uh, and, and an opportunity to actually uh, show your expertise as opposed to just covering standards. 
Well, in your school, when they do professional development and the professional development, that is, do they, I don't, well, I don't want to use the word use wrong in the wrong fashion, but do they use your knowledge and experience to help teach the other teachers? No, yeah, at this point, my methods are very disruptive. You know, it's not cool. So uh, right now we have very traditional methods of professional development, but I think, again, as more and more people start adopting this, we do have technology training, we do have a lot of um, new, and, and my district is very good, our leadership is very good about listening to what the teachers need and providing for it. Um, so I, th I think it's just a matter of time before everybody is doing like uh, ed, ed camps, like Edutopia, um, where the teachers, you don't ever listen to a lecture other than, you know, the teachers come to present and share as opposed to listen to lectures. We've pumped out, pumped out as a state about 13,000 teachers since the first time we talked about this. And basically, I, I stand to be corrected, I'm happy to be corrected, but I think without this kind of understanding by the time they got out of their teacher ed schools, because it's hard to change. I mean, you said culture to begin with. I admitted at the last meeting, you know, and this isn't even transform transformative, as David's saying, this is just substituting. So I knew I was going to get on a plane. I realized that in my background, I shouldn't admit, but I skipped some of the Russian novels. So I downloaded Crime and Punishment because I didn't want to carry it on the plane. But it still was just a substitute, basically. And yet, even that small change for me, culturally, is I like a book, you know, and I like the feel of a book. And so if that's even disruptive for me, it's it's easy to say and harder to do. So this isn't criticizing the ed, ed institutions, by the way. It's just saying that we got to get going, though, because the kids are passing us by, and, and the technology is, and they're doing all these other things, and they're like real life, and then they come in. And I've done, I think, 65 district visits now. And overwhelmingly, again, I'm, I'm not criticizing. This is what I do in my grad class. I, I haven't figured this out. I don't have, you know, I haven't spent the time you have in the, the heavy duty labor intensive part that you've described. But the overwhelming number of classrooms. Uh, are still pretty traditional. You know, you walk by them, you walk in, you're visiting, and and it's, uh, but I know this, that the teachers really want to yep. get to this next step. So how do we, part of it is the PD, the boards talked about for existing teachers and how we incent that. And then of course, trying to get this pipeline going quickly, because it's just, you know, 13,000 teachers, as I said, trained since the first time we brought this up, and I don't think much has changed. Right, and then I think, you know, there's a, there's a paradigm shift. Again, we're all now trying to work. Now there's Common Core coming down. You know, the idea of Common Core, that concept is very standardizing. And so that's another clash to the system because, um, I mean, I, I'm not against uh, Common Core, but, you know, the, the dissemination of that is going to have a lot to do with, you know, we have to consider that because if we have to worry about the standards, teaching the standards, every PD is about failing students and standards no longer, like, you know, most of our PDs are just about getting that grade. I Let's think, just I get think that the grade. the bridge is, though, kids need to know fractions. Mm -hmm. And kids need to be proficient in reading at third grade. So it's trying to f invent this new world where there's a balance between what you're describing, but having, you know, I, it, it's not either or. I mean, if right, we have kids is. that don't yeah, understand right. math, they're going to get ripped off by mortgage people at some point in time. Not that I mean, I love mortgage people, <laughs> <laughs> wherever they are, but, you know, I mean, that's what happened. They didn't understand They're what everywhere. they were signing. Many adults, it's like you just don't, so there's this kind of tension between understanding concepts that we think about as Common Core and others, and then, but allowing freedom and how to learn that and understand it and... It's, it's, it's proficiency versus knowledge. So now they're not only proficient, but now they're knowledgeable as well. That's, that's a good point. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, Mike, because we try to promote financial literacy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. That would help. That's right. Counts as math now. John, that's please. Present. So does the uh, performance on the MEEP and things take care of itself in I think what it you would, do? would, wouldn't it? I mean, like, a Is that your experience? Because my observation so has been great teachers, they do their thing, right. and it's clearly linked to are they learning the right stuff, but then it, they they show up on game day and it, right, it's, it's right. they don't have to do special stuff. Well, you know, in our in my department, my social studies department happens to be like a really phenomenal department, and so we always beat everybody on everything. So <laughs> I, I don't have a clear idea of exactly what this method is doing mm -hmm. versus the other method because I don't have this <coughs> for a long time, only for a trimester. I could arrange that for you. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, 
Not, so I, I don't know, but I, c I can imagine somebody who's a critical thinker. I mean, here I'm not doing any of the thinking for them anymore. Somebody who is innovative in their ways. They're creating their own apps for learning. I don't know, I, you know, answering a, a, a MEEP question is just going to be a piece of cake. I think you demonstrated it beautifully with the 51 percent. Uh -huh. Yeah. Was doing both. Yeah. There's, a, there's a standard issue, understanding percentages, and there's a group or a presentation issue. There's a, you said an hour or whatever to put it together and right. think about. I mean, it's a beautiful example of combining those. And in a, su a successful marriage, I mean, it may look like a bunch of kumbaya, but you know, the backbone is all the standards. You know, you just build everything that you want to have, you know, all of their goals. Uh, and at the end, like when I said, like the Da Vinci Code, you know, it's almost like you create a crime scene. And, but the goal is the standard, and so they can go around looking for everything, but you want to, this is where you want them to end up at the end of that, you know. Any last questions, uh, Nancy? Uh, I, I think this is <coughs> more a comment, but an ending with a question. One of the things I've experienced recently that is, is really frustrating is when you try and help students in mentoring and tutoring them, if you don't happen to have sat in that particular teacher's classroom at the time, and then you try and help a student understand a concept, even though you're getting the concept to be understood and the knowledge to be imparted, if it isn't done exactly the way they did it in the classroom that day, the kids don't accept it because that's not the way we do it. And what you're <coughs> talking about, I think, is talking about getting to a common goal mm -hmm. in a variety of ways, in whatever way our students learn. And the 20-some in the, in the students you have in your classroom may learn in 20-some different ways and so really the, 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 the process um, in getting there, as long as they've gotten the concept and can apply it over and over and over again, that's what's important, yeah. not how they got there. So I think one of the challenges for our teachers um, and our principals and our parents and everybody engaged with that student will be to accept learning in whatever way their child can, can handle it and see the, the, the result, not the process, as the goal. So do you see that as a, a challenge that you have? Most definitely. I mean, parents are, you know, they don't know how to help their child in this, you know, so it's very, very difficult for them. So I think as a teacher, as part of, you know, one of the things that as teachers we're trying to do right now is just community outreach. And so there's going to be this summer a lot of, you know, technology 101 over in my classroom, free of charge by, you know, and, and just bring them in and just show them you know, not necessarily how they're learning, but teach them something this way. Um, th that way they can feel comfortable about that. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have straight A's, it becomes an issue. Well, yeah. and I think to that point, uh, it gets exactly to where I've, I know the board, John, I apologize harping on this one more time, but as we look at what teachers who, uh, yeah, um, as we look at college students who are wanting to become teachers, if we don't embed technology within the very pedagogy and the core content that they're that they're learning, instead of having oh I took technology 107, yeah. um, that's not going to get us there. No, no. We have to do it in the way the very way in which we work at becoming a teacher needs to be technology rich and and integrated. Or, or exactly like they, you need you need to learn how the students learn. So any course that a <coughs> any teacher takes right. has to be in the way that you want the students to learn it. Or exactly. the w in the way that you're going to teach it. So if you exactly. teach it in the, if you learn it in a traditional mode, that switch in culture is going to be much harder than if you learn Something it this way. Really, we have to work with the colleges of education. Mm -hmm. I mean, we passed that policy a long time ago. Yeah, it's still not happening. It is, is the trick, and mm -hmm. how they teach it is the trick. Right, and I think what you may pass this afternoon has, uh, or you know, kind of the governor's, <coughs> the piece about the governor's uh, message that you're reaffirming has lots of that embedded in it if we do this right. And they want to do this. I mean, it's a struggle. I mean, I'm acknowledging myself. It, 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 it isn't easy to do. If it was, it would be done. But we really need to, it is an urgency to this, because as I said, 13,000 teachers in the last couple of years in Michigan alone. And, and how to, how to, I mean, I'm an adjunct prof. I'm not modeling it. So I'm part of the problem. You know, so at what point do profs have to kind of quickly get up to speed so they can model it? That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. Dan, you were next, I think. Uh, maybe a, just a comment and then a question, actually, for Joseph. So thank you guys for this. Uh, it strikes me that um, the discussion we're having, I mean, so students are going to, like, so this will happen whether we <laughs> embrace it or not. With or without right, us. Right, that's right. With or without <laughs> us, it will happen. Um, 
uh, students certainly are learning um, using um, far different platforms than we used when we were all in school. Um, so it strikes me that the revolution here really is around um, what we've been talking about for the last few minutes, which is uh, the role of the teacher and kind of the shift from pedagogy to maybe more of kind of an andragogy, kind of student-driven learning. And it's not even different ways of learning, right? I mean, you could have 25 visual learners in your classroom, but what they find interesting and kind of where they drive in terms of the content will be different for each of the 25 or, you know, 20 of the 25 will find different different tracks and kind of still find their way to the Da Vinci code, sure. but, um, you know, through very different means. Uh, but that, so this, the, um, the, the traffic jam bottleneck, whatever the right metaphor is, around the assessment is an interesting question for me, and so I'm really curious, Joseph, around what the use of kind of the consortium, the Smarter Balanced, and the, is it Park? Park. Yeah, what the two consortia are considering in terms of the use of technology in assessment, the regularity of those assessments, and one is kind of an, a summative and, and one is more ongoing. What's the, just, can you give us a few minutes on, or 30 seconds on kind of use of technology in those assessments? Yes, um, both consortia have, di have indicated that they will be going entirely online. Um, both consortia also will have paper and pencil options for places where the, where the um, infrastructure is not yet sufficient. But um, we will be driving that need, we will be driving that appetite for online assessment simply because we won't be able to put the money toward returning paper and pencil results back quickly. It will be about returning online assessment results back very quickly. Um, the differences between the two, um, the assessment that Park is talking about is what they're calling through course assessment where you take a part of the assessment one third of the way through the year, another part another third of the way through the year, and the rest of it at the end of the year. It essentially kind of defines the scope and sequence for the local schools. Um, what Smarter Balance is, is doing instead is they're doing what's called um, <coughs> benchmark assessment that can be done throughout the year to kind of keep track on where kids are. And at the end of the year, then it's an online assessment that covers everything during the year so that you maintain that local control and you also maintain um, the ability to <coughs> monitor students over time in not such a structured way, but in a much more flexible way. And so that's actually one of the reasons that we chose Smarter Balance is because it offered that flexibility in the local control. And, and Joseph's smarter, so. <laughs> and he's more smarter balance. Yeah, and more balance. <laughs> <laughs> We're not so sure about that one. <laughs> Final questions before we break for Richard, please. Well, there are a number of themes that are intertwined here which, which can easily be confused. One is we forget, um, we forget the wonder of, of people in schools when electric lights came in and instead of having to light 20 kerosene lamps and the attendant danger of, of knocking one of them over, you could just throw a switch and how much instructional time that saved. Um, that's an example of an innovation that really impacted schools. It provided an extra subject for kids to study. How does a light bulb work? Okay. But fundamentally does not transform learning. I suggest that a lot of this digital stuff is of the same order. It makes a lot of tasks very efficient. The standardized testing is a stellar example. You know, the kids don't have to do those first 20 questions that everybody knows. They don't have to do the last 20 questions that nobody knows. They only have to do the middle 20 questions that determine their, their approximate level, okay? And then online you get instant results, okay? So, I mean, there's a good example of you, you cut out six months or how long has it taken me to come back to us? Uh, right there. So it, it's, it's, it's a wonderful invention. We should embrace it, but on the other hand, has it fundamentally transformed the, the learning task? Now with learning, there's, there's two other themes, I think. One is simply the structure of knowledge. The more we have access to billions of facts, the more important 
the basic structure of knowledge, what Edie Hirsch calls the, the, the core knowledge, okay, becomes. Because then you have a, a schema to assimilate all this new knowledge that's, that's coming your way. So rather than obliterating common standards, I think it makes the common standards that much more important. And then the third one is, and this, this is, um, C.S. Lewis has pointed out that, you know, when you're learning a new subject, there's, there's a, a period of tedium. And especially, most of us experience this, uh, especially in foreign language. You know, you go through two or three years of tedium, and then you master the language, and then it's fun. Okay? Uh, think of when you learned Monopoly. The first game you played was agony because you had to learn all the rules. And then once you had the, the, once you had the rules down, you know, it, it was fun. It was enjoyable. That's the paradigm for learning. Uh, we have compulsory school precisely because the, the beginning is tedious, and the goal is to bring kids to a point where they learn on their own. Um, most of us have been through that with reading. I think maybe 30 to 40 percent of us maybe made it with math. I, I I did not in school, and then I came back and taught. Uh, I had one of those. I had one of those teaching certificates that said I could teach all uh, great, all subjects in seventh and eighth, including those I'd never actually studied myself. <laughs> <laughs> and so I taught math in middle school for a number of years with uh, with uh, no background whatsoever. But in teaching, you learned it. I learned it, and it started to be fun and then I could understand those nerds and I knew in middle school who <laughs> said they actually enjoyed math class now you know it took me two decades later but I finally caught up but anyway uh, the point is then that the structure and learning is this tedium and then you get to a point where you can have have fun it, it's clear Matinga that your kids are having fun and um, but I think we still have as as you acknowledge you know you th the opening is you got to teach them how to learn, what the expectations are. So I think there's still a lot of structural elements that, that are the same. Um, uh, and then the final theme is what is the medium of instruction? In the Middle Ages, it was Latin, so everyone had to learn Latin so they could learn other things. Uh, the, the iPod folks would like us to uh, make uh, the iPod the medium of instruction, so everyone's going to learn to use the iPod. And um, uh, I don't have to tell you the economic uh, aspect of that too um, and uh, uh, it, it may well be it may well be the the medium of instruction but I think that's that's one of the issues that's what is the best medium of instruction should we buy into this one or is there another one uh, we don't want to be like uh, Taylor School District which built beautiful Truman High School based on the open classroom concept <laughs> Okay, we know how long that fad lasted and uh, how successful it was. Um, so uh, I guess I, I take a little caution in looking at these digital learning. And, the, and not that there aren't wonderful things that we should be looking at, but the claim that it's transformed uh, education, I guess I'm a little dubious on, on that claim. I, if, if I may, just quickly rebuttal sure. that. Sure. And we're going to wind down. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, and the standards are very important. You know, it's you know, it's almost like a kite needs the rope that is or the yeah. line that's going to sh you know yeah, anchor. Yeah. Uh, but but it's also what technology I think in the 21st century has provided is a, it's, it's a all, everything is anchored on a boat, so it's shifting. So you know, back in the day, it was like Brit Lit was the alternative, American literature or Brit Lit. Well, why not? Indian lit and talk about the Bhagavad Gita. You know, why not? Why do we have to, you know, like now there's all this world of literature right to their access with translation um, that is still literature, but it's just a different, you know, but part of the cultural literacy was Brit lit. You have to know Shakespeare. If you don't know Shakespeare, you don't know anything. Um, but now there's so many other things, and as the students are becoming more globalized, they have to have the standard is just broader and it just shifts as opposed to just being in that one spot. Romeo and Julio. Julia yeah, both died, if I recall. <laughs> um, are we Kids would learn pretty much? I just have one statement ahead. I'm going to make for, for hopefully for Richard's um, <coughs> sake. Um, when they they found the invention of the tourniquet that saved people's lives from from bleeding out to death, they also found that if you didn't use it appropriately, you could die. Yes. And so I think it is with anything, mm -hmm. and education is no different. All these transformative 
potential tools are wonderful, but if they're not used correctly, you're right, they are going to be transformative in reality. So well, I think what we had an example here of today was transformative in reality. Um, used and so, correctly. Yeah, and it was <coughs> used correctly. So it's just going to take time for us to all learn how to do that. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you guys. This was really exciting and great. And um, uh, let's see, can I suggest do we want to push 130, which is 35 minutes from now? And we can do that and come back. Public participation and move on. This fits very nicely inside my.